Hi everyone and welcome to another story episode of the Liverpool Connection podcast. I'm your host, Daz. Um, if you haven't checked out our last uh, few story pods, please do. Uh, the last one was with Ray Houghton, uh, absolutely boss fella. Um, the one before that, I do believe, was our three-year anniversary one with Jan Mulby. Um, Again, you know, I couldn't ask for uh, any better uh, three-year guest. Um, you know, grew up watching Jan, absolutely amazing footballer and just an amazing person. But yeah, please go check that out. Uh, today's guest is Jeff Miol. See? Close. Close enough. Close. See? I'm, I'm getting there. Um, I, I might go back and, and, and re-edit that. Miol. Hey. That's it. That's better. We'll 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 get there in the end. But anyway, um, Jeff is a, a senior agent for Wasserman um, Music Limited, and uh, I'm going to bring him on to tell his Liverpool story. Um, you know how he became a Red supporter, his first Anfield match, and then we'll get into uh, the music side. So, Jeff, welcome to the Liverpool Connection podcast. Thank you. Good so, to be here. Let's. Delve in way, way. I'm not. I'm not saying you're that old, but just <laughs> a, a few years ago when when you started uh, supporting the Reds as a as a young lad. Yeah. So uh, born in the late sixties in the South End, um, uh, split family. Dad's side were all Liverpool. Sort of can definitely go back trace the Liverpool thing back to my grandfather, who used to take my dad and his sort of uh, seven brothers to the game. My mum's side they're all blue, so my sister's blue. But I obviously got the good end of the stick and sort of, you know, obviously got taken to the match by him. And uh, yeah, that's how the story started, basically. So he, he was he was a season ticket holder um, up until the sort of late 70s, early 80s. Um, our first introduction was, and I, he used to take my sister along, not that she enjoyed it very much, but we used to go to all the reserve games because back in the, those days, the reserve games always used to take place at, at Anfield and we stand in the paddock, which is where his season ticket was. Um, and yeah, it's sort of, you know, all through the seventies probably went to sort of, you know, most reserve games for, you know, for at least five or six seasons. Cause I think that was just a better introduction to football for us. The derbies in those days used to be great. They used to be have about sort of, you know, 25,000 people in them as well. So, you know, they used to open up all the bar to the, the ground there. And then obviously towards the end of the seventies, he started taking me to a few games. Um, would have been. Probably about 79, I think, probably been the sort of first time I was taken. Uh, started going more regularly in the 80s, um, sort of, you know, 81, 82. And then obviously started doing the classic thing of sort of going with my mates and leaving my dad behind, sort of, you know, in about 83, 84. Had a season ticket from 84 to 87 before I went to college. Um, and obviously that was, a, I had a bit of a period where I didn't see too many games for sort of 87 through to 92, 93, and then sort of moved to London. Um, obviously started using, you know, context to get sort of into games to, so, you know, all mates of mine who still had season tickets and stuff and um, got lucky to share in the season ticket sort of in the mid to late 90s. And uh, yeah, go up to Anfield, maybe live in London now, but go up to Anfield maybe six, seven times a year, but Go to a lot of away games, sort of, you know, that's kind of where I where, where I do now. Obviously, a lot easier for the London games and, you know, I like the European aways and all that sort of stuff, really. Um, do you remember your first, I mean, not the reserve, but your first, like, first uh, first team match? Do you know, really weirdly, I can't actually remember what the first one is, which is actually a really shit thing to say, isn't it? So that's not what you should do. But there's, there's actually one of, in my programme collection, I've got, there's a programme from 81 when we played Brighton. And that would be sort of the, the first time. And actually, I, I, I remember standing in the Anfield Road at that, that time. So my dad had given up his season ticket at that stage. So we sort of, we used to, you know, we'd have had to pay on the door, basically. So uh, my first sort of few games with him after we left the paddock would have been in the Annie Road end. And then a couple of cop visits. And then when they seated the Anfield Road end in about 83... Uh, we used to get lad and dad tickets a little bit and then we ended up sort of going into the cop sort of, you know, maybe a season or two after that, basically. Yeah, it, it, it's so, um, like, you know, like my granddad used to take me. But my, yeah. my first game without my granddad, I was like, Billy, big balls. I mean, yeah. you, you just feel like you've you've stepped into another, another yeah. you know, era. You're just like, it's me now, you know, without without 
you know, looking at, I mean, my granddad yeah. would still, still be there, but like we'd go at different times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it so is. So you, you know he'd look out for you if you needed any help, but basically you were still sort of, you'd gone off with your mates at that stage, basically, yeah. Yeah, you know, like you'd a, go down the pub and have a pint, you know, while, while you know, my granddad, uh, you know, he'd, he'd go with all his his mates. But it, yeah. it was just a time when you're just like, you know, now I, I feel like invincible, you know, yeah. to speak. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, my first, so I, I, I actually can pinpoint my first sort of game without sort of my daddy probably was there and probably went into a different part of the ground, but so I arranged to meet sort of a bunch of mates from school and we all met, well, arranged to meet up on the cough one uh, uh, European game, I think it was the Lech Poznan game in the, so it's 83, 84 season. Um, and basically we all arrived and none of us met up with each other because we were a bit too naive and stupid and arrived at different times then. And, you know, obviously in a massive, you know, what was it, 24,000 people standing on the cop in those days, you know, so, you know, we all, all said we'd stand in a similar sort of area and didn't find, but you know, the next time we all found each other and, you know, the, the whole sort of match going with your mates sort of the experience took off from them, really. Yeah, it's, you know, there was, I mean, for, for me, granddad, you know, uh, there was always like a, a, a point after the match mm. you would just meet up with me just to yeah. make sure, you know, I was all right and there was no trouble mm. and stuff. Yeah. Same with away matches as well. He'd do exactly the same thing. He'd, you know, go down on the train with me. Yeah. Uh, we, we'd just go different little sections of the away section. And yeah. uh, he would just meet me after just to make sure, you know, you know you're know, you all right. And like, mm. hey, you know, do you need any money? And it's like, usually, yeah, granddad, to do. <laughs> yeah, well, totally. Money yeah. for pints. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So who, who was your... Um, you know, who, who was your poster, you know, poster player on the wall growing I think up? The, f- the first player I sort of like, sort of, uh, I fell in love with, is that the right sort of um, expression you use these days? But it's um, Alan Anson. I just, I love the class of the man sort of as a defender, basically. Um, you know, t- to then see him sort of play live. I mean, obviously, you know, he was in a team with Kenny and, you know, you can't ignore the fact that Kenny was on the pitch. But there was just something about Alan Anson and the way he sort of, you know, held himself on a football pitch, used to love the way he came forward as well. You know, there's the very classic in the um the five nil uh Goodison away, you know, he sort of like there's a there's a scene where he just strides out and waltzes past a couple of players and I used to love it when he did that. So he was yeah, definitely the first sort of hero and I, when I was playing I was always a defender and so, you know, sort of like although I was never tall enough to be a centre back, you know, is uh I mean I definitely that's probably why I gelled with him the most. So is it is it safe to say like your your team was the eighty team? Yeah, totally, totally. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, I've been watching you know through well four sort of decades now. But I mean, yeah, I was really lucky to you know spend a lot of time. In, I, it, well, obviously, I lived in Liverpool. I went to a lot of matches, and you know, the the eighty five eighty six season. I, I think I missed three games or something. It was just you know, I was you know sixteen, ten, and seventeen, and you know, obviously, the world's your oyster and. You know, we had a team where, you know, sort of, it was the greatest season to follow them, wasn't it? You know, and it was amazing. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, I always have to pinch myself because from that team, probably yeah. 85 to like 89, you know, yeah. I've I've been able to interview at least yeah, yeah. nine of them. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, because that that's some of the best football that I've ever seen. And, you know, yeah. apart from like the Klopp era, you know, yeah. uh, last season and to, to for the last, not last season, that's just yeah. gone obviously. But this yeah. before that, a few seasons before that, you know, I think that's the closest to the eighties kind of team that I've ever. Yeah. seen, You know, yeah. The only the only other one other is you know the Suarez sort of season, you know, with them. Um, so Brendan, you know that's that's the closest I think we come until Klopp came around. You know you could have to go back to that. Yeah, exactly what you say. Eighty, well, eighty four to sort of. You know, I mean, I remember the seventies side, of course, but you know that would have been more from the television and you know the occasional seeing one of them in the reserve game occasionally. But yeah, the eighties eighties sides were just what a joy to watch. Though that time was. Yeah, they were, they were pretty hard men as well. You know, I mean, Steve McMahon, Ronnie Wheel, yeah. even Mulby is just. Uh, oh. uh, you, you don't you don't see that as much um, like in a Liverpool team. Well, I mean, you, no. you're barely able to tackle them nowadays. Yeah, exactly, eh? yeah. But you know, I I think like I've always thought we needed. You know, I I still love Fabinho, um, mm. 
But I wish we had like a, I mean, Milner, you know, if James Milner could have come in maybe, you know, six, seven, eight years younger than what he, what he was when he left, yeah. uh, I would have loved that because, you know, he does his, cron- he lets you know, yeah. you know, yeah. he's right next to you. And I think, I think that's what we've missed a little bit. I think in in the in the Klopp era team, uh, that's just mm. my opinion. I'm sure people are like, you know, nah, we we haven't missed that. But I, I just missed that the crunching tackles. I mean, well, really, can... I'm sorry. Well, we grew up, we grew up we grew up on it, didn't we? It was amazing. I mean, the players you mentioned in there, Moby, you know, I mean, what a what a fucking player he was. You know, it was just you know, the, just again, sort of. I remember he t- I remember when he arrived, he, 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 there was a little sort of settling in period, which obviously happened to a lot of players, but. Once he settled in, he was just, you know, he was just a dream to watch. And he's, I was there when he scored the goal against United, you know, in the uh, in the in the League Cup, which I, you know, then we took us twenty years before we got to see it again, you know, mm-hmm. the story of that. And you know, I still remembered it, and you know, sort of as the hardest thing I've ever seen, I've ever seen a player hit a ball, you know, into a goal. It was incredible. Tumble down the clock, the cop, you know, sort of further than I've ever tumbled, sort of, you know, <laughs> before, you know, ended ended up sort of, you know, 50, 60 yards ahead of where we were standing. It was incredible. Yeah, yeah it, it, it it's mental how he he actually told me the story. You know, he he had the video tape. Yeah, yeah. Nobody knew apart from I. I don't know how it got out. It was Atkinson. It was Atkinson gave it to him, didn't he? Because it was because they were they were recording it for a training purpose as well. Yeah, they? yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And then somebody had found found out later on and asked Jan, "Don't you have a tape of that goal?" And he was like, "Nah, no." And they were like, "Do you?" And then I guess he, you know, he, he just said like, you know, uh, what what's the harm? Like, yeah. I mean, because my granddad was at that match as well, you know, yeah. and I, I didn't see the goal. I, I didn't go to the match. And he told oh. me about it, and just, I mean, just watching it on the videotape on YouTube doesn't yeah. do any justice because, as you just described, my granddad said it took it took the net off. Yeah. I remember. I actually, met, I remember reading in the papers the next day. So for some reason, but my dad used to buy. I did, as a scout, I never understood. He used to buy the Daily Express, which is the, the weirdest paper in the world. But he liked the um, quiz thing. Yeah, they like the word searching. It, so he just bought a paper for that reason. Um, but I remember sort of reading and thinking Gary Bailey sort of actually said it was the hardest shot he's ever faced. And he said, "Had I got up more of a hand to it, it would have taken his fingers off." Is what he thinks, you know. I mean, it was like, and yeah, it's just great to see it again. You know, yeah, definitely. Um, Amazing memory that goal. It reminds me of, of you know a little bit of John Arnarisa. Like yeah. he, he had a rocket and um, that oh, yeah, totally. he scored against United. Yeah. Again, you know, nearly took the roof off. Though th- those are the kind of goals. Like I love the little mazy runs from yeah. players. But when a player hits it from you know 25, 30 yards out, yeah, and the goalkeeper dives like two minutes later, just yeah, 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 yeah. for show. Just to yeah. make it look like you know well, the, the, the great the great thing about that goal it was it starts with a crunching tackle because he goes through white side takes the ball off him does a mazy run and then rockets it basically so everything you love about football in that one goal yeah it's an amazing one hundred percent yeah I yeah. mean if uh, if the listeners haven't checked out the Moby versus Man United goal oh, the, yeah. on YouTube and uh, yeah it's a cracking goal so yeah. um, in in the nineties, you know, <laughs> not a very good, uh, very good time for Liverpool. Yeah. You know, yeah. Tunis taking over that didn't didn't work, um, you know. And then towards the the later end, you had Evans mm. did okay, and then Julie, you know, the double the double managerial, which obviously just did not work one bit. I I don't know who came up with that. Uh, it was a terrible decision. I think both men knew it was wrong, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, thanks to Roy kind of stepping away, I think, you know, probably, you know, to this day, it probably eats at him, yeah. I, I, I would say, you know. Um, well, yeah, uh, well, yeah, I mean, that side was amazing coming forward, but they just couldn't yeah. defend. And, you know, obviously, it was, you know, I mean, it's it's like a, the biggest cliche ever, but it was true. You know, they just everything he tried to do in defence couldn't do. But what an exciting team coming forward all the time. You know, it was actually a great side to watch. You know, and sort of obviously, you know, the players that came out of that side as well. But yeah, defence was just never Roy's thing, was it? So, 
Well, I mean, you know, in, in the first, uh, like, Brendan years, same mm. exact thing going forward, yeah. were absolutely amazing. Mm. And then our, it, it was more more of the we can score more goals than you yeah, can. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was yeah. great. It was great to watch at some sometimes, but you know, many a time, you know, you're biting your nails, just like how how's this going to end? I mean, oh yeah, totally. Even even two nil up, you're just going, yeah, no, we haven't got this. You know, I mean, it's like you know, a number of times people people came back at us all the time. You know, so. it's what happens. You know, um, when we played Palace, mm. and we need we, we needed what ten goals. Yeah. Um, we're three up, and and you know it ends in in a three three draw. But uh, you know it was just that l- love of like Suarez mentality. He's a fighter, and he's mm. you know when we're three nil up, it, it's one of those you you just want to take your foot off the brake. But he was just like, come on, we can do this. Um, and uh, and I'm going, no, no. How are yeah. we going to score ten? Like yeah. it, it was just mental. But uh, you know. Um, it, it's it's crazy to me to all all you know the players that we've listed that the Malbys, mm. uh, you know, Suarez. Uh, we've just had amazing players for, for this team. You know, he, he, even in dire situations, the nineties, we still had really good players. Yeah, two thousands. You know, mm. I mean, Owen. You know, great player. You, you can say what you want about you know where he went to. Uh, you know the Madrid and then United. Mm. Yeah. Again, to to watch that little lad on the pitch. Yeah. It was phenomenal. Yeah, I was there. I was there when he made his debut in the sort of Wimbledon game at the end of the season at Palace, basically. And you know he sort of tri- he had he was fighting for a penalty, and it was just yeah, it was just you, you saw something was going to happen with that kid as well. You know, so and we he, and he did give us three or four amazing years, and then you know just sad what came afterwards, really, isn't it? You know, so. Well, I mean, you know, as they say, um, the grass is isn't always greener on the other side and uh, mm. you know, it, it didn't really happen for him I didn't mm. mind joining Newcastle uh, yeah. but it was when he joined United I was just like I'm not having that yeah, no. 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 Yeah. well I mean it, it, it it's strange you know um, e- even uh, when you play for Liverpool and then you go across the park you know mm. and there has been quite a lot mm. uh, and I, I don't understand that you know yeah. It's either you can play for Liverpool or you play for Everton. You, mm. Not, not, not both. Not both. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, some footballers have different mindsets than we do as fans, don't we? So, you know, well, they do. Yeah, I mean, I'm, quite a few of them, especially these days. You know, there's no like, like, I would say l- love for the club. You know, mm. the, the, there's no like affinity to stay at one club. I mean, you know, mm. we've. We've had Gerard and we've had Cara. They've been mm. one club players. You never hear about that these days. You know, yeah. it's long gone. It's it, it's it's about the money or it's yeah. about you know winning trophies. I mean, for for me, like Harry Kane has been one of the best strikers on, mm. on the planet. You know, he, he's up where there with the best of it of England, but he's won nothing. You know. And uh, maybe this is the season where he, he's finally going to, he's had enough of... Well, there's there's lots of chatter about that over here at the minute, you know what I mean? He's yeah, like, I mean... Um, I mean if, might, might be off to Bayern, might he? I think that's one of the, the biggest bet, I think, at the minute. Yeah, well, I mean, that that's another one, you know. Um, can can they get one over on, on Levy? Because he's a, an astute businessman. So he certainly is. Uh, he doesn't have to, you know, give away Kane for for basically, you know, peanuts. So uh, mm. that, that that'll that saga will probably go on till the the last, uh, you know, day of the transfer window. Um, exactly. So, you know, what have been some of your your favourite matches that you've you've gone to? I can all, 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 the number one. I mean, obviously, I, I'm lucky to have gone to loads of finals. Sort of, you know, obviously, you know, I was at Istanbul. I've been at everyone since. Um, Done most of the FA Cup final since the eighties. I, I only missed the Wimbledon game, which actually was quite a lucky one to miss. Um, my favourite game of all time remains. I think sort of anyone who was there was when we played United in the semi at Goodison in eighty five. Um, you know, it was it was being at Goodison. You know, and taking over the Gladys Street was you know something that you know obviously is you know we never you know it was it was a novelty. It was 
a match played against the background of, you know, when football rivalry was just so intense. It was like, you know, those, those years where, you know, it was it was dangerous to go to football games sometimes. And that match, you know, people will tell you, you know, there was sort of, you know, a lot of uh, sort of hard men sort of, you know, spending sort of time doing things that they probably mightn't be overly <laughs> proud of or maybe still proud of outside the ground. Uh, we were a miles better team than they were. The match kicked off. They played much better than we did. They scored... You know, we were terrible. And then we equalised in the last minute, which is, you know, always one of the greatest things with that sort of great um, Ronnie Whelan, curling goal, you know, cue pandemonium, we're in the Gladys Street, sort of, you know, sort of limbs, as they say now these days, everywhere. Um, we go into extra time, as you did in the FA Cup in those days. The game carries on exactly the same spirit. They score again, you know, so they're, they're winning. And then we equalise again in the last minute of injury time. And that is just, I still, you know, it's giving me goosebumps now. Sort of, I, I had my glasses punched off my face. Um, bizarrely, saw them fly in the air in this madness. And a mate of mine actually picked them up off the floor, completely, like, untouched, which is just, I don't know how that happened. Um, and, yeah, just that, that system. I just, you know, to equalise once in the last minute is amazing. You know, or score in the last minute is amazing. But to, to equalise twice against them in that atmosphere at that place was just, yeah, it just remains still my sort of, you know, favourite moment in football, I think. Um, sadly, we then went to Main Road three days later and got beat sort of 2-0 by them. And sort of, you know, they went on to sort of play Everton in the cup final because that's where we, we were due to go. Um you know, some of, some of the other great matches, I mean, obviously Istanbul, you know, sort of, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in saying what a incredible sort of, you know, long day that was. You know, it was, uh, you know, I, had to, I flew from Luton at like, I think our plane left at 5am. So I was, I was up there at two and, you know, obviously, you know, the longest day ever of sort of drinking and then up in the, um, you know, the, the, the trip to, you know, 50 miles away from sort of the city centre and all the madness that happened there, the terrible first half, the the comeback, the penalties, um, and then, you know, the longest trip ever back to the airport and getting back to England, you know, I think I was up for like over 24 hours that sort of day, you know, small sleep on the air, airport four. Um, the 86 Cup final, again, you know, obviously, again, but, you know, the, the sort of, the, you know, the excitement of obviously playing an all Merseyside final when, you know, the actual atmosphere between the two teams at that stage was pretty decent. Um, uh, you know, obviously, again, to go 1-0 down and then make an amazing comeback, you know, it was just, you know, and to win the double. Um, uh, that same season, I had the joy of being at Leicester City, the, the penultimate game of the season, when Everton were running up, were, were, were about to win the league and they needed to lose against Oxford and we needed to win the next two games for us to win it. And exactly that happened, basically, which is, you know, just, you know, I think, I think Oxford, Oxford, you know, but Oxford United in the, in the top division, that's so bizarre, isn't it? But I think they, they scored in like the 81st minute. So obviously, you know, that last nine minutes of our game, you know, at the same time as theirs was incredible. So yeah, I mean, yeah, I've been, I've been lucky to be at a lot of big games over the years. And you know, I was at the, um, the five nil, um, it's a fact that he's last, game I ever went to with my dad before he died the Forest 5-0 which is one of the you know the greatest performances from that mid 80s side sort of going as well so um and yeah over the last few years you know I've had some amazing times again you know the Suarez season you know that was you know the the Fulham game where we sort of scored in the last sort of couple of minutes you know to keep the sort of the the run going um and yeah what some of the stuff I've seen with Klopp over the last few years has been absolutely amazing as well yeah it's um like f- for me, the away adventures are yeah. the best. You know, yeah. just especially you know now that we're in the we're in the Europa League. You know, uh, pe- people are a, a bit pissed off, and you know uh, this football club needs to be in the the elite Champions yeah. League too. But we're in the Europa League. We're in it to win it. Um, but you get to go to you know we, we don't know yet. But yeah. We'll, I'm sure away supporters will get to go to places they've never been before. Yeah. And it's part of the adventure. And, um, yeah. I, you know, even though, like, you know, you got to take a boat, you know, car, taxi, what, whatever, a plane, you know, mm. that's part and parcel of it. And, um, you know, that's one thing that I do miss that, you know, I, I don't get to do the away matches, obviously, yeah, yeah. you know. When I'm home, I, I I go to home matches, but the away matches, you know, it's too much for me. Um, but for yourself, you know, you say you, 
like last for for last season. Um, yeah. How uh, much tougher you know season that we we've had ever before. Um, but yet the away fans just singing the hearts out. You know, mm. every single time. You know mm. that. If if you go, I just wish sometimes pe- people on on Twitter would you know just stop, uh, yeah. just complaining, and maybe go on YouTube and just you know watch an away match and just watch the away fans. Mm. Like I'm I'm just so like proud of them. Just like they they really just. They, Embody everything about Liverpool Football mm. Club, if you know what I mean. Like, yeah. we could be having the crappest of seasons, still singing, still singing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you've got to take the rough with the smooth, you know. I mean, I, I've obviously I've been around sort of a long time, so I've seen a, I've seen a lot of up and downs, you know. It, I started when it was only ups, you know, and then the downs came, and you know, the last few seasons we got the ups again, and you know, a season like last year, you know, is just you just have to take it in its stride, and you know. I, I did start at the start of this calendar year. I saw us lose at Brentford, Wolves, Brighton. It was just like the two draws of Palace and the draw of uh, Chelsea, where we played awful. But you know, I still, I, you know, it's you know, it's still on my. T- I'll still do it every season until I'm sort of you know not able to because yeah, it's just I love it. You know, I love being you know with my people and having that sort of thing in your soul that you know that we can't explain what it is but you know we go along and we take the bad times with the good times you know and luckily we've had some good times recently yeah and i think that's you know i mean we want we want more good times obviously but you know mm. that, that's just that's football for you you, you yeah. get the highs and then you get the lows mm. um so let, let's go into you know i mean and and football and music Go hand yeah. in hand. You know, yeah. Football, music, and and uh, fashion go hand in hand. Mm. You're you're part of the you know the music business. Um, and you know I saw some of the bands that you've you've looked after, booked. You know Muse, Paramore, mm. Zootons, who who I absolutely love. Um, mm. how you know did you plan um a career in 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 you know the music side of things? Not really. I mean, I just basically ended up sort of, you know, leaving Liverpool in 87, um, went to sort of uh, college in Oxford, I actually went to Oxford Poly and Oxford University. Um, and you got myself involved in the sort of entertainment scene there where, you know, sort of, you know, there was a few bands coming through and playing. So, you know, I I, I ended up be, becoming a sort of social secretary at the uni. So I started buying bands, you know, that we're doing once a week off agents, um, which is what I am now. Um, basically, I didn't even know what an agent was, like most people don't, you know, that sort of, you know, if, if, you, if you're not involved in live music. Um, and, you know, at the end of my sort of year of doing that at college, you know, applied for a few jobs, you know, in the music industry because I thought this is where I want to be. And luckily, uh, one company said, you know, we, we've got a spot for a sort of trainee. So I shipped to ship myself to London, basically, you know, on a absolutely ridiculously low wage, you know, sort of struggled for quite a few years. That was the toughest time to go to football because I couldn't really afford to uh, pay rent, never mind, sort of, uh, you know, sort of go on football trips. But, um, yeah, just picked up some experience and, you know, um, sort of uh, learning how to book bands and learning how to sign bands, you know. Um, so, you know, first first you sign them, then you book them is, is kind of the, um, you know, the mantra of, of what our job's about. And, um you know, this this was probably the sort of early nineties. Um, I started to uh, discover a couple of bands that sort of started to break through. I was I was around at the time, sort of when my career was developing around the time Britpop developed. So I started looking after quite a few of the sort of Britpop bands, Gene, Super Fairy Animals, things like that, um, Biss, Cider Wild, um, and yeah, that started sort of you know the the, the first levels of successful band booking I, I did. I sort of um, late nineties discovered Muse and was with them for sort of you know almost twenty years, basically until a couple of years ago. Um, and yeah, you know, it's just you know, it's um, it's it, it's an interesting job. It uh, <laughs> gets me to I, I get to travel around the world. I sort of you know I get to uh, do things a lot of other people do, but you know, uh, don't be fooled. It's not just it's not as glamorous as it might sound. It's it's mostly tied to a computer. It's mostly sort of you know sending emails and. Uh, doing logistics and sort of, you know, negotiations and, you know, 
learning, knowing about European tax rules and European visa rules and shit like that. So it's very, um, uh, and dealing with egos of bands and sort of, you know, having to sort of book bands into festivals and stuff like that. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting sort of life. And, you know, I don't think I'd, I'd change it. Well, I certainly couldn't change it now because I've, I've been doing it for nearly 30 years. So, yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. You know, we talk about footballers with egos, bands, yeah. definitely, especially front men. But what's um, what's the like? You know, some of the riders that that I've seen because I, yeah. you know, I I DJ as well. Um, right. But you know, I me and me mates used to book you know top DJs, and some of the mm. riders were just like, "Are you having a laugh?" I mean, what 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 are some of the, the craziest riders that you, you've seen for a band it's um there's two ways there's two um ways that that happens basically you do get the ego rider where you get some artists who will put ridiculous things on riders because they're kind of ridiculous people and you know they're sort of their expectations of what how they should be treated is um sort of out of kill out of kilter with sort of how the world works you do get also a lot of bands who will do a joke rider for the yeah. fun of a rider, basically. I don't know if you ever see. There's, there's a classic Iggy Pop rider where the um, I don't know if it's, it's online and it's you know their tour manager was blatantly taking the piss, basically, and he kind of sets people on a on a sort of like um, you know, sort of um, uh, ghost hunt sort of thing, you know, where people, a treasure hunt, basically, is what I mean, you know, where people are if you find this one thing, you've got to find another thing. So you know, there's a bit of that, but um, yeah, it's it, it's funny. It's actually changed as well. I, I think sort of from the the 70s 80s into the 90s when the sort of music business was a lot more rock and roll and you know sort of excess was uh sort of more more sort of uh normal than it is now it's you know people are professionalized or not and one of the things people have realized if you if you're a successful band and you put something on a rider at the end of the day you're paying for it because it comes out of the the show costings and you know if you, you ask for somebody to drive you in a rolls royce you know you're fucking paying for that <laughs> it's like so uh don't is what most people have learned now, basically. So, yeah. Now, for, for you being still in the industry, you know, yeah. um, for your take on things, because, you know, it, for, uh, uh, music's just a bit like fashion as well. You know, mm -hmm. it comes and then goes, it comes. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, Brit pop was massive in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. 2000s, you know, uh, you had a... Or, Late nineties, the grunge, yeah, and, and new new metal as well in that period as well, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, nowadays a lot of the, this pop stuff is mm. just commercialized, you yeah. know. Um, and I I love it when I discover new bands, mm. you know, that little little spark, the little you know shine in your eye, and you just like you know these are gonna go far. Um, how, how, how do you like, like look at a band? Do you, do you go see them first? Yeah, pretty well, pretty much. I mean, I think sort of because I'm sort of like a, you know, 30 year old, I think we call ourselves veterans now agent, you know, I, I have a reputation. People know who I am in the industry. You know, people know, you know, what I can do historically, what sort of bands I could do. Like, you know, people do specialize in different sort of genres of music. Sort of my, history of sort of what everything I've done is is basically guitar based you know I've, I've dabbled occasionally in other, other worlds but you know I don't know anything about sort of EDM music I mean I know what EDM music is but I don't know how to book it um I've you know I'm a, I like hip-hop but I've never worked hip-hop artists and things like that so what would happen is um the majority of stuff that I I sort of you know would be interested in starting a, a relationship with and sort of dealing with would come from either people approaching me because they know who I am and they sort of want to do it or somebody I know tipping me that, you know, this is, you know, this is something you should look at. You should talk to this person. So, you know, there's a lot of networking going on and that, you know, I don't have to do what I, I would have had to do sort of, you know, as I started my career and, you know, go out seven nights a week trying to discover bands. Um, I mean, the world has changed anyway, you know, discovery is now done on a computer, you know what I mean? It's like, so, uh, you know, obviously, you know, when we when we were growing up, you know, the only way you could hear a record was if you bought it, taped it, or somebody played it on the radio. Now I, we can listen to anything at any time, you know, you know, sort of from our phone or from our computer, you know. So the, the trends have changed, you know, things the way um, 
the speed of the music industry has changed, the way sort of bands develop has changed. But, you know, the principle of what we still do is live music. We're still booking shows, gigs and concerts for and festivals for our artists. And we still have to find artists who are, who are new and help them develop their career and keep them going. And, you know, I have artists, you know, I've taken on three weeks ago and I have artists I've looked after for 25 years. So it's, it's always a balance, basically. So Yeah, it just seems just, such a tough business, um, you know, because you can have one great gig and mm. then you can bomb and yeah. it's just like, you know, they're done. I mean, I, I didn't even like how like kind of the BBC wrote about Lewis Capaldi, you know, mm. uh, quit show his, his, you know, his vocals weren't good. Mm. I mean, you know, the, the lad has a Tourette tick, yeah. you know, but that, if it that could have been just some upcoming band, mm. you know, that uh, had the same issue as Lewis, and then people read, you know, online, and then they'll go, yeah. "Yeah, he must, he must be shite." Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, if, if, in fairness, the actual, I mean, he's one of our clients actually as well. But um, the the coverage over here was actually maybe better than it was in the states for you. You know, there was definitely a sympathetic sort of, um, you know, sort of. Um, uh, you know, view from the press to, you know, what had happened and how he did. I think he will come out of it, you know, obviously after he has yeah. a rest and sort of gets his mental health in a, in a better place, you know, I think he will have a rest. I think we, the industry sort of, you know, from when I started in the 90s has definitely got better, you know, still needs to improve more, you know, looking after sort of artists and stuff like that. I mean, artists are highly strong people, you know, they sort of, you know, they if you, if you want to be a lead singer, you've got some thing in your head in the first place and sometimes what then happens to you success or not success you know will affect you in in ways that you know nobody expects as well and i think i think you know the industry's got better but it still has a you know can still be better all the time so i think like for me uh, a great story is um jamie webster yeah S singing liverpool songs and <laughs> you know obviously that got him through the door but you know it's his talent and, yeah. you know, he deserves, like, ev everything, all the praise possible. And mm. then to be playing, um, actually, this weekend. Yeah, he's in two, two uh, nights, 20, 24,000 people. He saw that really easily as well. Yeah, uh, Pia Head is just, yeah. uh, you know, I'm, I've known Jamie for a couple of years now. Mm. And he's just, you know, he he's down to earth, you know, how mm. some some bands, uh, the, the lead singers just become absolute, like, bricks. You know, J Jamie will never. I, I'm, so, I'm saying nothing, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mom, mom's the word. No, uh... exactly. So, um, who, who, who's a good upcoming band that uh, that's on your your kind of roster? Uh, well, if you want to, you know, I've got a couple of things I've just taken on, sort of, um, like really recently. I've taken on an Australian band called the Terries, who's sort of um, starting to break Australia, and I think it, there'll be a global story about them. Sort of good little guitar band, got of half sort of got looks like a bit punky attitude, but sort of you know also plays sort of sort of quite melodic music. It's like I'm sort of feeling quite sort of confident about them. Uh, who else have I just started working with? It's always the hardest question you can ever ask a, a booking agent who you're working with because we're always <laughs> we're always working with whatever we do. I do a lot of sort of um, as well as like indie guitar. I do a lot of rock and metal things as well. And I've I've just started working with the sort of Japanese band One OK Rock, which is selling loads of tickets. And I feel really confident about them. And um, yeah, you know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's that the hardest question you've just asked me there. It's like, it's like yeah. I don't know sort of whether there's an equivalent question you can ask anyone in another industry, but we always we always forget who we represent as well. It's like because I think I represent about sixty bands at the moment, and I'm only looking after their live career. You know, the managers look after the other aspects of it, and we usually you know collaborate with the managers to put together a, a strategy of how we sort of you know see their live work go um you know we do have a relationship with the artists because we go and see them you know we, we meet them usually at a pitch and things like that basically so yeah so how you know during the covid time must have been re obviously really hard for yourself it, and, it, and fans it was awful it was like we were the first industry to close and we were almost one of the last industries to reopen um you know, sort of, you know, for the, the reasons that people did what they did, you know, obviously uh, live music shut down because, you know, you're talking about social distancing and gathering of people, you know, the only way you can do music successfully is in that environment. 
Um, so March 2020, I had two or three bands on the road. Um, I had one band who was sort of um, uh, the American band X Ambassadors were on tour in Europe uh, towards the end of uh, February. They were due to play an Italian show on the tour and that got cancelled. And then we rolled into, we rolled past into Vienna where they played. They went up through Germany and played a couple of, sh- I think, a show in Austria then and then got to the it got to Poland, um, loaded into a gig in Gdansk, um, and then uh, were told that they couldn't play because the Polish authorities that night had sort of um, decided to close everything down. So the, they they rolled on to Lithuania for the next show, um, which was a day off. They were to, they, the promoter was ensuring that they could play the next day. Um, and then uh, Trump, for all his wisdom, decided you know he was going to close the borders to everybody. So they then had to fly home. So they you know they lost thousands and you know, tens of thousands of pounds on on the tour income. And you know that kind of happened to loads of people. And then nobody was able to to do any gigs anywhere globally outside of a couple of rogue things like Australian bands were able to tour Australia and Kiwi bands were able to tour uh, New Zealand. But, you know, there was, there was a couple of social distance things which made no money for anybody, you know, a lot of hard work until the UK opened at the end of July 2021. So, you know, we were closed for like 15 months. Um, you know, our company, we had to sort of, you know, make a lot of people redundant, put a lot of people on furlough, had to work out, you know, how you deal with, you know, our income is predominantly from, the commissions that we make from artists paying, playing, and then obviously that tap was turned off completely. So yeah, it was yeah an awful period. Not want to live through that again. And and coming out of it is also there's lots of challenges. The you know you're probably sort of aware in other industries that the supply chain has has fallen over. Um, you know there's not enough people around to you know do sort of you know road work, crew work, security. People are just are missing. You know it's it's taken a long time. The cost to astronomical so you know bands who probably previously made money on tours are not making money now because you know they're spending all their money on the the cost of the, of the, of the shows so it's uh yeah it's it's it, it's tricky it's you know the superstars will always do well and they're still doing well superstar festivals are doing well you obviously saw how good glastonbury was you know there's, there's positives but there's a lot of challenges since yeah, yeah i listened to uh no gallagher interview and yeah. uh you know, he, he just said, you know, if you're a singer songwriter, mm. and well, you know, obviously he was established before COVID. Um, mm. He said it was just good to him because he was able to just write. Yeah. They're totally, yeah, he's totally different. I mean, I had a number of bands who were, you know, breaking at the time as well. And you've seen, you know, when you start breaking, everything has to move at the same time because, you know, it, it's like, um, you know, it's like a roller, not roller coaster, I can't think of the word I'm looking for, but you know, everything sort of moves along and you know, you get bigger each step by step, and all of a sudden, all these artists who weren't able to play for 15 months, you know, the world moves on and people are involved, you know, into new things. So, bands who would have previously rode a different type of wave, you know, were not able to ride a wave. So, I've seen a lot of people's careers that are damaged by what happened in that period as well. So, yeah, it's, it's tough to recover, you know, mm. I can't imagine being in a band and then just, just about breaking and mm. then. You've got two years of not, not doing nothing. Yeah, yeah. That's, you know, that's that's the best thing I think for a band is to be on the road. Yeah, with yeah. Lots of people, you know, because yeah. that's you know, yeah, digitally, you know, you can c- correct people's vocals and, mm. and make this, you know everything sound pristine. But when you're out on the road, that's that's raw. You know that that's when you you know. Yeah. That, I think when a band is really good, when you're just mm. like, that sounds pretty close to what the album mm. sounds like. You know? Yeah. So I can't, and, the exc- I can't- and, and the excitement in the room, you can't replicate that. You know, people did a lot of streaming gigs and things like that. And, you know, some people got it right. A lot of people got it wrong. But it just, you know, never re- re- reciprocated what you, what a live event is. You know, it's like, you know, it's a social gathering. It's people coming together to... You know, have a communal experience with sort of an artist and something that they love. You know what I mean? So, you know, and when that didn't happen, your know, bands couldn't move forward. So let me ask you this: I, I usually ask uh, the musician guest this, but uh, mm. top, if if you were to put on a festival, mm. who would your headliner be on a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday? Alive or dead, or are you allowed to do all of them? It, it's it doesn't matter. Yeah, alive or dead. All right. 
All right, well, if I was, I'd probably, I'd probably have it all, all dead about it. I'd obviously, lo- I'd love to see Queen again. I saw them in '86, the last show at Nebworth. I'd love to see Bob Marley. I never got to see Bob Marley. Who would be the third? And the first two are really easy, aren't they? Basically, so yeah. maybe, maybe the third, I'd be, I'd be all selfish and I'd put a load of bands I've worked with and put them together and sort of, you know, have a day where I could sort of chill out because it's already sorted out, basically. So you know. That's, that oh. that might be where I went. <laughs> <laughs> no, you you you've got to stick up for your band. So yeah, I, I, yeah. I agree with that. So, I guess I guess I would have wanted to see the Beatles, you know. So obviously, I do know a few sort of old heads in Liverpool who who did have that experience, you know what I mean. But uh, obviously, way way before my time, obviously. So yeah, that's the same with my granddad. You know, he got to see him, and I'm just like, man, you know, because I'm a massive Beatles fan. I yeah. just, you know, they just. Four of them together were just magical, you know. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And then, you know, obviously John Lennon, uh, you know, kept going. Paul kept going. Mm. Ringo does his thing. Yeah, uh, totally. Yeah. George did his, but yeah, I mean, for me, it'd be be the Beatles, and I never got yeah. to see Queen either. I mean, right. uh, obviously got to see Live Aid, and that that yeah. that was just probably the best. What twenty minutes I've ever ever seen. I mean, what a show! Oh, yeah. You know, I lo- I love me Liam Gallagher. He, he yeah. to me he's rock and roll. I, I don't care what people say. I still I still like him. He he's mm. just he just is rock and roll to me. But like, Freddie was a showman. He was oh, rock totally, and yeah. he was yeah. a showman. And uh, yeah. I've, met, I've- even as a massive Queen fan, I've never been able to go and watch any of this sort of, you know, the, the version they did with Paul Rogers and now the version with Adam Lamb. I've got no interest. I just couldn't see it. It's like, you know, and I know people love it and I, you know, good fair play to them for sort of carrying on and so I'm doing the level of success they have, but yeah, no, no interest to me. Yeah, it's a bit, it, to me, it's a bit camp, you know, mm. the, the new one with Adam. It's just yeah. too, like, it's just not Queen. If, if, yeah. You know, without Freddie, you mm. can't ask Queen, yeah. just can't. You know, yeah. just uh, if the the Beatles and John or Paul had left, it wouldn't yeah. be the Beatles. It just wouldn't. Nah. I, totally. I, yeah, I mean, all for if the people want to go see it, but yeah, not for me. So mm. let's come all the way back around. You know, yeah. we're, we're in a time, we're in Klopp era. You know, yeah. thank God he, we have a few more seasons left. Uh, James Pierce said, looks like 26 will be... Is his last. So we have a few more seasons. We we have watched some of the best football um you know I've ever seen. Uh, that front three of Mane, mm. Bobby and Salah were just absolutely world class. So on that especially on the nineteen twenty season, you know, which obviously was sadly curtailed, but I mean fucking hell, what a, what a what a run that was up until that that Wofford game, which I was sadly at as well, basically, but you know. Yeah. I, saw, I saw I saw a lot before the Waffle game. It's like you know it's to enjoy. Yeah, it's just you know we, we, again you know we we've t- I think we've taken things for granted a little bit with mm. Klopp and and the team and uh, you know a, a lot of old older mates of mine have said mm. you know just enjoy the moment. Mm. You know I, I mean yeah t- you you can say we only won one league in 30 years which again as as a you know big club as we are we should be winning more obviously but we've also been up against a juggernaut in city you know um a cheating juggernaut yeah am i allowed to say that on here why not uh, I mean, both, of us, both of us might get sued for that but it's like you know it's like yeah it's, yeah, I mean, yeah. We, we talk about 115 charges against them. Yes. There, there, there was charges for UEFA as well. They were able mm. to, you know, get out of that. Um, you know, we, we've just been up against that, you know, mm. lost lost the league by a point, you know, uh, mm. came close to winning the Champions League. I thought we were the better side against Madrid. You know, yeah. we were just caught on, on the break. You know, mm. it, it happens in football. Um, and, and Courtois having the game of his life as well. That was the other yeah, thing. Exactly. I mean, he's a, he's a world class goalkeeper, mm. but mm. again, he there was it just seemed like it wasn't our day. There was he was yeah. stopping everything. Um, but how how what what do you feel that we need to do? Um, obviously, I just think it it was 
one of those perfect storms last season. Playing all the games that we can the season mm. before. Yeah. And missing out on the lead by a point mm. to Madrid. And then barely a pre season. Yeah. Then those early injuries to mm. our midfield and then the World Cup. You know, they're not that they're not excuses. I don't I don't call them excuses, I call them facts. Mm. Because it is a fact. All those are factual things that happened. Um yeah. what what do you think? Like we we brought in McAllister, which yeah. you know, it's looking like probably the bargain of the season mm. when you look Mount's gone for sixty, Havertz mm. has gone for sixty five. Mm. Declan Rice is 105 obviously the English tax there yeah. well well played West Ham um, mm. you know well played to them for sticking to the guns but for 35 McAllister walks into our team mm. like almost immediately for me um, yeah. do you think we need a massive rebuild or just at least another two players who can I would say I would the- say I would say two to three. We obviously need more sort of, you know, defensive cover. You know, obviously this sort of, you know, you know, we we have obviously first class sort of fullbacks with, you know, I think Simicas on his day is a is a great replacement, but I think that didn't have the best season. And, you know, I'm not sure if he's actually going to stay on. But, you know, I don't think there's too much we've got behind sort of on the fullbacks there at all. Centre backs didn't have a great season last year, but obviously, you know, we we know what they're capable of when they when they can play. I'd like to see definitely, you know, one or two brought in sort of as, you know, sort of um, cover or development sort of there. Uh, I'd love to go through the next season with a sort of fully fit functioning midfield. You know, we, as you say, those facts, you know, we, we didn't last season. You know, we had a, a bunch of sort of players, who, you know, like, like in Milner's case, you know, he probably wouldn't have played the way he would have played if the other people had been injured. And, you know, he could have been used in a very different way. You know, he's, I mean, you know, the, the Fulham game at the beginning of the season, to me, he was the man of the match. People, when he came on in the 65 minute, because he calmed everything down, and that's that's what he was he, he was good at. Um, I think Fabinho had a really bad season. You know, I, I don't think Klopp expected him to fall off the cliff, sort of like quite what he did. Hopefully, it's an I can't say that word anomaly. I, I, I think I got it there. Um, you know, I, I, and he may come back. He definitely played better in towards the end of the season than he did at the beginning of the season, but was such an influential player in the, in the seasons before that. Um, you know, if McAllister can sort of, you know, bring strength in, I'd still like to see, you know, one or two more midfielders. Um, you know, the forward line, I, I think we're happy. I'd love to see sort of Nunes settle down. I, I've um, I had a theory about him at the beginning of uh, last season when, when he started playing. I sort of, I thought he was like half sort of Zlatan and half Ronnie Rosenthal. And there was a period in the season where he was like 90% Ronnie Rosenthal and 10% Zlatan. He's like, it's either a worldie or a sort of miss on the, on the goal line, you know what I mean? But I mean, he's obviously a raw talent. Gakpo, you know, you know, came in at the worst period and, you know, we played him in years and looked like, a, you know, like he was a terrible fit, but man, he, did he settle down and, you know, is he, I think he's somebody who, you know, he's, we're going to play around his style a lot next year. Salah didn't have his best season, still put in 22 goals, you know, and, you know, he's still, you know, he's still young and fit and, you know, capable of, you know, coming back into form. So, you know, we're, the squad's there. It needs a bit of work, you know, to, to sort of make it a little bit stronger. And we've got to get rid of the mistakes that we made last season. But, you know, I'll put some of that down to everything you're saying. You know, we we were running on sort of empty by the time the end of the season before came. Um, you know, the, the, the short break, the World Cup in the middle of, you know, a lot of things conspired against us and the injuries. So, you know, I'd like to put that behind. You know, Klopp's definitely the man to sort of, you know, know how to how to fix it. And I'm sure they are, there is, you know, for, for all of my moaning on my uh, Liverpool WhatsApp group, which Big Tony's <laughs> part of, you know, I'm sure there is sort of work going on to try and sign somebody else, you know. So, yeah. yeah, that's the thing. I, I think, you know, with, with the whole FSG thing, um, it's just left a bad taste in people's mm. mouths, you know, not bringing in a midfielder last, yeah. last season. Well, we did, but, you know, we all know how that turned out with uh, Mello, <laughs> you know, just yeah. absolutely. He's, he's going to be a quiz question in the years to come, isn't he, basically? Sort of, you know, he's yeah, like, how, you know. Yeah, probably how many minutes did Mello yeah. play? You know, I mean, it's it, it's not his fault. I mean, a, yeah. lot, a lot of abuse was at him. Not mm. his fault that... Um, yeah. He was doing extra training 
he got injured and it was a bad one. So, you know, we, we should live and learn. But I think there's just a bad taste in people's mouths. I mean, we already brought in McAllister before the window even opened. And yeah. I think everybody, quite a lot of the our fan base now are, you know, they're like, where, where's the next one? Where's the next one? You yeah. Know? Um, well, that's just, I, I, I've always, I've got, you know, again, sort of the arguments we have on our water group, but I've, I've also got a theory that, and I'm, I'm definitely not angry in any shape with Klopp or whatever, but I also think some of it is down to him because I think he yeah. is so definitive in the type of players he wants. And, you know, he waited for Van Dijk, he waited for Alisson, you know, which, you know, to the detriment of half a season before Van Dijk arrived, we, you know, our defence was a shambles until that happened, basically. Um, and I just think he's, I, I think, you know, he, he won't ever settle for, you know, a stopgap, you know, where maybe last season would have been the time it would have been beneficial. But, you know, he's only after definitive players to fit systems that he wants to play. And, you know, maybe it was a bit of sort of tightness from FSG, but equally, you know, I think part of it is Klopp, you know, wasn't going to buy a player he didn't want. You know. Yeah, I, no, I, I, I agree. And he mm. can't be stubborn, you know. Yeah. I, we, we should have let a few players go the season before Ox and uh, Kate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 100% yeah. should should not have been at the in you know in the squad last season. I mm. mean, I think uh, I saw a stat where they barely played seven games between them, which is just horrendous, you know. Yeah, and, totally. and and for me, you know, I I'm starting to think of like Thiago as a luxury player now because I see that. He play more than. 25 games a season mm. it just seems but you know I, I just I, I have belief I'll always have belief in this in this squad you know mm. even if, if we, we've we've had horrible squads before and we still believe we are still Liverpool Football Club I still mm. think we can compete against City you know Arsenal have spent a lot of money already you know Chelsea how, how in hell they've spent 600 million is just beyond me um, you know I'm not no and, understanding of that whatsoever, you know. What I mean, it's, it literally looks like their owner is insane. You know, what I mean, it's just yeah. like you know, it's just yeah. Which you know, would I would love nothing more than to sort of see that have them relegated us, you know, but by his madness, you know. And I mean, finishing twelfth, that's not that far off, it is it? You know, what I mean, ah, so, yeah. exactly. So um, you know, money doesn't always buy you, you know, what what you want. I I trust in Klopp as I know you do. I know a mm. lot of listeners do as well you know we just have to believe i think we'll go again if we can get mm. these players bedded in i i think we'll challenge i really mm. do um yeah. you know, i think and i think and if we do keep him i think you know i a, a, a back on form for being you know is you know he's you know he was you know for, for a while he was the best defensive midfielder in the league and then last season he wasn't you know what I mean? it made a hell of a difference to everything that happened to us last season yeah i just think we you know they need needed to go away. I I still find it in insanity that some of these players are still playing internationals, mm. you know, especially after the World Cup and what what you know the short preseason last season. It's mm. just mental. I think you know FA and FIFA and UEFA cheat some of these players like they're just That's crazy. Yeah. You know, at, least, at least, Mo, at least Mo's been having a nice time. He looks like he's having a good time on all. Yeah, day. he does. Uh, both, 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 both chilling, like both chilling out and and keeping fit as well. So you know, he obviously posts his fitness videos as well. Yeah, it, it'll, it'll, uh, I, I think you know, again with with the right additions, um, I think we'll see Mo get back to his best. Mm. I think Nunes will have a breakout season. Um, more, more Zlatan, less running is what I want to see, basically. Oh, please, if, please. If he if, yeah. if, if can change that to 90%, 10% the other way, that's better. Yeah, well, on, on that note, uh, we'll leave it there. But yeah, <laughs> uh, thanks so much. Uh, no Jeff, worries, good speaking, mate. Tell, telling your story and, um, you know, it, it, it's always great to, doesn't matter, you know, who you are, if you have a Liverpool story to tell, you know, it's it's just fascinating, you know, every walk of life, as a as a different story to tell, you know, to say we all love the same football club, but it's how how you arrived to supporting them and you know mm. and, uh, where where you came from and all that. So it's always great to hear. Excellent. All right, nice speaking to you, man. All right. Well, um, thank you everyone um, for listening. Um, please like and subscribe. And uh, like I said. If you haven't checked out the Ray Houghton one or Jan Mulby one, please do. Um, until next time, I'll see you later.